so thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, my residents are here, I believe, and people on my team. I don't think, uh, at least in the medical community and a lot of other uh, malignancies, people uh, really understand the power of these support groups. Uh, they're, they are particularly pronounced in sarcoma. I think GIST is probably has the most vocal support groups. Uh, but don't underestimate the influence you have uh, both on the patients but also the physicians uh, as well. So um, both in the ability to funnel people to the appropriate institutions but to help patients troubleshoot problems that they're having go as they go along. So I think just really is a model for the support groups for just is really a model for that. Um, I'm going to be talking today about the uh, epidemiology and a little bit about surgery. Uh, I thought I'd mix in the history of GIST uh, as it emanated from UCLA because there's some very dis uh, concrete uh, examples of how the work we did or, or my predecessor, my father, and our uh, peer at UCLA that laid the foundation for a lot of the stuff that uh, has snowballed since. Um, so I'm going to sidetrack a little bit from what Bartos had wanted me so that you guys, or at least the patients from here, can take some pride in when I have you sign that research consent or we track your information down and stuff like that. There's reasons for that. And there's some examples as to why that's important. So, uh, the history really is centered around two people. Uh, this is my father, who uh, has been interested in sarcoma over his entire career. He was actually originally at the uh, National Institute of Health uh, during the Vietnam War era. And surgeons had to do, uh, at the time, physicians had to serve. And doing research was a nice way to get out of going to Vietnam. So all of a sudden, <laughs> research became very interesting. And uh, his original research was on doing limb salvage sur uh, surgery. They used to amputate everybody with sarcomas. And they kind of figured out by giving treatment for bone and soft tissue sarcomas, they figured out how by giving treatment up front, you didn't necessarily need to amputate. So some of the original trials. Uh, my other, or the other component of the history is uh, this gentleman here. It's Dr. Murray Brennan, who was the chairman of surgery at Sloan Kettering for 20 plus years. And his academic interest is also sarcomas. Uh, he was also at the National Institute of Health, and he followed my father there. Uh, and I had the opportunity to train at, at both places, and there's, you can see there's a specific reason for that. Uh, this is my wife when we were both uh, at Sloan Kettering. So, GIST uh, didn't really exist as a diagnosis uh, until. Well, 1999, 90, 2000, uh, GIST was kind of lumped uh, together as kind of GI uh, sarcoma, GI stromal sarcoma, this, that, or the other thing. They didn't have a good way to differentiate between GI lyoma sarcoma and GIST and this, that, or the other thing. Um, and it was a real problem because <coughs> these patients are, or in the pre back era would invariably develop recurrent disease and it was all over their abdomens. Uh, they developed a, instead of a carcinomatosis pattern, we called it a sarcomatosis pattern, where multiple nodules throughout the abdomen, uh, somebody who presents with advanced disease, basically. So patients with a high-risk primary would get operated on, and the recurrence risk was, was extremely high, and so we had this pool of patients with these multiply recurrent, multi-nodular disease in the abdomen. And, uh, in an effort to do something about these patients prior to Gleevec, uh, my father did a trial here where he gave intraperitoneal chemotherapy to these patients. Uh, this is I I was I wrote this up. This is night. This is a paper from I think it was published in 1999, so be just before Gleevec was uh, came out. And I actually presented this at CTOS in uh, Connective Tissue Oncology Society in Milan. And I, 1998. Um, this paper 
I mean, the patients didn't do very well, uh, and which speaks to the need. This is a survival curve in the two years you can see, you know, most people weren't doing too well. Um, the majority of the patients were uh, GIS, um, kind of in the pre-defining GIS era. There was no C-Kit marker at that time. Um, what, what, what it did do is it decreased the risk of the disease coming back in the abdomen, but it had no impact on the disease developing in the liver. So the survival of the patients really was no difference. It just cut down on the number of surgeries they would need. So I had a, a little bit of success, and there's a kind of a subset of surgery or cancer surgery that's very interested in giving intracranial chemotherapy, and I'm always invited to participate, even though I'm not interested in it, uh, because of this paper. Um, and people still seek uh, me out or us out for this. Uh, thank, thankfully, there's a, a great drug for this uh, disease, as you all know. Uh, but this paper, I published it. In 1999, and Dr. Brennan, who I didn't know at the time, wrote an editorial on this paper. And it was a very public, <coughs> thoughtful commentary that kind of, uh, you can read through it. But he kind of, in a very nice way, compliments my father and I on this. And uh, so I, after reading this, I'm like, well, who is this guy? I'm very interested in, I found out he was the chairman of surgery at Sloan Kettering, and so I said, well, I, I should go train with him. He's interested in sarcoma. And so uh, I was hooked after Dr. Brennan wrote this uh, art editorial on this paper. Now, this, at the, the other person, he was a young attending at the time, his name is Ron DiMatteo, he was at Sloan Kettering, and the American College of Surgeons was trying to put together a trial. And so Brennan basically told Ron to write up our intraperitoneal chemotherapy trial to run nationally. Well, Levi came out. They pulled the intraperitoneal chemotherapy out, and Ron, and they substituted Levac for Ivers' primary disease. And so Ron ran the first adjuvant trial for or just, and it all comes from this uh, intraperitoneal chemotherapy trial. So the whole, it was nationally set up for this. They just flipped out the IP chemo and put it in the back. And thankfully, it worked out much better. Uh, so there is a very strong historic precedent for treating this disease here, even though we don't use this anymore or it's not something would pursue. Uh, this is a slide actually I borrowed from Bartos, but um, this is really a, a Sentinel paper by Hirota in Japan. I'm sure you've all heard about it or, or read it where he defines <coughs> CKIT or CD117 as the driving mutation in this in GIST. Um, and uh, that resulted in first patient being treated, so this is 1998, first patient got treated in 2000, and it was rapid fire from there on out, and really it's the most rapid progression of a drug from the clinic, from the laboratory to the clinic, and it's like the model of targeted therapy, really. Um, so, when I arrived at Sloan Kettering, Dr. Brennan already had some ideas about what he wanted to do. So one of the things that, so we're going to shift to the epidemiology, that's a little bit of history. There's Sarcomas are obviously rare tumors, so less than 1% of solid tumors in adults just is a subtype of uh, soft tissue sarcoma. Um, there's over 50 different sub histologic subtypes of soft tissue sarcoma. Uh, this is a slide from my time at Sloan Kettering. Uh, but just is actually considered to be the second most common type of soft tissue sarcoma, or actually some people even consider it one of the more common. Um, each subtype responds differently to treatment, they behave differently and the like. It, it kind of historically has been lumped together. GIST was one of them. Uh, as we've learned more about the disease, they're all playing out in terms of responsive therapy, recurrence patterns, and the like. 
Uh, and depending on the site of the primary disease, there's a different outcome. Depending on the histology, there's a different outcome. Uh, and depending on the size and the grade of the tumor, there's different outcomes. And this is just an example of looking at high-grade extremity sarcomas broken down by size. Uh, this is uh, greater than 10 centimeter extremity sarcoma. Obviously, it's very high risk with a two-year survival or a five-year survival of less than 40%. So in 2002, well, so the staging system for malignancies is uh, the AJCC staging system, American Drug Commission on Cancer. And it's primarily a TNM uh, staging system, tumor node metastasis. And it's absolutely awful for sarcoma. People always ask me, what is my stage? And to be honest with you, I don't know their stage because we never use staging uh, or at least the TNM staging system for sarcomas. Uh, it's not a very accurate for all diseases, but particularly bad for sarcoma. And what they did in 2000, this is Mike Catan, he was head of biostatistics, or he was a biostatistician there. He's now head of biostatistics uh, uh, at Cleveland Clinic. He developed something called a nomogram. Um, for, this is for soft tissue sarcomas, not just, but this is where it comes from. And it was based off the Memorial Sloan Kettering database. And what it does is it integrates the various prognostic factors for your subtype of sarcoma, and it spits out a 12 year disease specific survival for an individual patient. So it's obviously much more accurate than the TNM staging system. Um, and as an example, size, depth, and grade are in the uh, AJCC. TNM staging system, but site, histology, and age aren't, and they're all prognostic factors for these patients, so they would not be accounted for. Uh, the nomogram, the original nomogram, was created off the slow Kettering database. Uh, the problem was that they didn't know if it really worked when I showed up there. And to see if it works, you have to plug in a, an external cohort of patients to see if it can accurately predict their outcome. And so the first thing that Dr. Brennan wanted me to do is to validate the nomogram at Memorial with our data set here. We have such a large data set of sarcoma. So that's what I did. We took the UCLA uh, patients at the time. Uh, the makeup of the, the patients was very similar. Uh, uh, the survivals were very similar, although we had a, a better, oops, better 10-year survival, I always like to <laughs> and then they did a memorial. Uh, needless to say, when we plugged our data set in, it was it accurately predicted the out, the, the nomogram accurately predicted the outcome of these patients. <coughs> so we based and this was published in Cancer. It, the nomogram was an accurate model to predict the outcome of patients. Um, so UCLA helped validate the original nomogram that was created for soft tissue sarcoma as a whole. And uh, as we'll talk about a little bit later, they've developed histology-specific nomograms, just being one of them that Ron uh, ultimately did. And I think it's important to understand what its usefulness and a little bit of the historic content, context. So just um, the incidence is not exactly known. People in here probably can tell you the incidence better than I can. Uh, it was a sarcoma that was pretty much ignored prior to uh, Gleevec. And with the development of the drug, its incidence seems to have risen, and uh, obviously the treatments for it. Uh, oncologists who were previously not interested in treating this disease have all of a sudden become very interested in it. Uh, we met less than 1% of all solid tumors. GI tumors, just like sarcomas, are less than 1% from solid tumors in adults. Uh, they can occur anywhere in the, the GI tract. Some is the most common location, um, followed by small intestine, and, uh, rectum, and colon, and esophagus. But they can really occur anywhere. Um, the typical immunohistochemical staining pattern is CD117 positive. Lots of tumors actually can be spotty positive for CKID. Just have a very characteristic diffuse uh, staining pattern where it's diffusely positive. Um, 
the central question for GIST is, uh, as of many tumors, is, is it malignant or not? Um, the two largest or most important prognostic factors for GIST are gray and or mitosis per high power field, or gray and size. Uh, mitosis per high power field is by far and away the most prognostic, important prognostic factor, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, there's been a number of studies that have looked at the various prognostic factors kind of in the pre vbac era for these patients. Uh, and having this data is uh, important because it helps you know, identify people that would benefit or should get treated in the light. And this is data from Sloan Kettering uh, showing the breakdown uh, or the difference between patients with less than five um, mitosis per 50 high power field and this is up to higher than five per 50 high power field. And there's obviously a profound difference. And when you analyze all the, or they analyze all the various factors for these patients, um, the mitotic rate was by far and away the most important prognostic factor. Size is next, and then location of the primary tumor has some prognostic value, although not that much, with the stomach being the best and the other sites being the work, not as good. Uh, there's a number of kind of prognostic models for this. Uh, this is uh, kind of a guideline for it, where if you really look at it, it's, it's a busy slide and it's kind of hard to interpret. But if you break it down into the greater than five mitosis per high power field and the less, you really see the drastic difference. Even with small tumors, there's a high risk of this, uh, the tumors going back if you have a high mitotic rate. So you can see how it really trumps uh, all the other prognostic factors. Um, so that leads to the nomogram. You saw where it came from, or its original version. Uh, and uh, Ron developed a nomogram, a histology-specific nomogram for, for GIST, and this was published in Lancet. And it, this is a, a really a core of patients prior to back. So you get an idea of how high risk these tumors were. And uh, this is, a, again, a slide I brought from Bartos. Uh, you take a... Uh, 56-year-old male, the way this is how it works, you take a 56-year-old male with a 9 centimeter gastric gist with seven mitosis per high power field. Um, nine centimeters gets 50 points, less, uh, this is wrong. No location. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, it's stomach, zero, and uh, greater than five mitosis per high power field. It's 80, that gives you, uh, you add up your total, uh, 130 points. Uh, at two years, the recurrence-free survival is only 30%, and at five years, 10%. So you get an individual, individualized outcome prediction from this. So it's very powerful. Uh, I found that patients uh, like it. At the time when, when we validated it and were deciding on whether it would work or not, um, it was unclear if it would be something that would be amenable. And there's been lots of prognostic models for various diseases. A nomogram is very easy for a patient to use, and it's become quite popular. So I, I would say about 30% of my patients have knowledge of the nomogram and have plugged their information into their, the nomogram as well. This is obviously a histology-specific nomogram, but it comes from that original nomogram that we validated uh, with the data from you all, basically, or whoever was treated here. This is a uh, interesting abstract that was at the Society of Surgical Oncology this past uh, two weeks ago when I was in Phoenix. And it took 500 patients with uh, GIFs from a series of institutions, Hopkins being one of them. And what it did is it plugged the patients in to the various prognostic models for, um, for GIFs. And just so you know, the memorial nomogram was the most accurate model at predicting the outcome of these patients. So that original, uh, and they had validated that actually, that original nomogram with some other data sets as well. Uh, but this is a large cohort of patients, 500 patients, and the breakdown, uh, you can't really see it here, but 70% uh, of the stomach and small intestine, very similar to the slide I just showed. Um, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit now 
talk to, talk to you about surgery. I don't really prepare a lot. Surgery is uh, the, the gold standard for these tumors. Um, uh, it's, although it's not entirely true, the field, uh, I've, I have seen people cure without surgery. It's very, very rare. Uh, uh, to cure somebody with disease, you need to take out the tumor. Um, the surgery is like it is for any other malignancy. Um, you need to completely resect the tumor. If it's involving other organs, you take those with it. Um, just like other sarcomas tend to push other tumors rather than invade, um, the extent of the resection uh, can vary depending on the site of the disease and, and uh, its uh, mitotic rate, I would say, is most important. Um, it rarely goes to lymph nodes. There are some subtypes that go to lymph nodes, but basically it doesn't. Uh, the big thing in terms of surgery is it's, it, is it is very important that it's done properly. Because you can take a, a curable patient and make them incurable. And I do see this a fair amount. Uh, I think the biggest error I see is people take, uh, the focus is on the scar or uh, you know, the extent of the surgery rather than just getting all the disease out properly. And the tumor will fragment or rupture or they'll get extensive bleeding uh, rather than just open it up and do a proper operation. Now, I do think it is safe to do laparoscopic surgery on some GIS. You know, who those are, it's not entirely clear. There's a number of series uh, recently out that show that. If you have a low risk, low mitotic rate, small GIS, then yes, I think you can take it out laparoscopically. If you have a large, high, mitotically active tumor, no, I don't think you can. That can be a hazy line on certain tumors, um, particularly if you don't have a, a good idea of the mitotic rate. Uh, one of the problems with uh, GIST is that they arise in the GI tract, obviously, and to get an accurate assessment of mitotic rate, you need to have a core biopsy, not an FNA. An FNA does not give you a good assessment of uh, the mitotic rate, and gastroenterologists are hesitant to do core needle biopsies on uh, small GIS or just within the wall because they feel like they'll perforate the tumor. Uh, the gastroenterologists here, I ultimately talked to them doing cores, and obviously they have a big tumor, you can just do a CT guided core. Um, we've not had any, anybody perforate with the core, and, and before he left for Yale, he was doing all the cores uh, for us. So we would have a good fix on the metodic rate and make an assessment as to whether that patient uh, can have a safe laparoscopic surgery versus an open and whether or not we thought we should treat the patient in neoadjuvant or not. Um, if you put GIST uh, in a historic context with other diseases, uh, locally advanced rec or high risk GIST, um, locally advanced rectal, locally advanced breast, uh, GE junction tumors, or gastroesophageal adenocarcinomas, gastric cancer, and the like. The trend is the same. The drug gets approved for patients with advanced disease, it ultimately gets pushed to high-risk primary disease, and then the question is, can we give it in a neoadjuvant manner prior to surgery? Uh, so it just pushes uh, the, the, it along the spectrum. Uh, it's obviously been approved for advanced disease, it's been approved for high-risk primary disease, and right now I think the next step will be uh, more solid trials uh, surrounding the use of neoadjuvant just for high-risk primary. Uh, I have to tell you, I consider it standard of care. If you know the mitotic, uh, uh, which the mutational analysis of the tumor, and uh, the mitotic rate, I think, if they have a high-risk GIST, you know, the mutational stash, I think they should be treated prior to surgery. That trial hasn't been done. It will be done. It will be the standard of care. Um, having operated on, we were writing up this data now on probably about 100 patients and treated neoadjuvantly with uh, um, Levac prior to surgery. Um, from a technical point of view, uh, the 
tumor, it's a lot easier to operate on somebody who's been treated, who's responded to therapy than an untreated gist. An untreated gist is very fragile, bloody tumor. It's uh, prone to fragment. Uh, you have to be very gentle with it. A treated gist shuts the scar down. Uh, you can manipulate it easier. The blood loss is a lot less. So from, a, from an operative point of view, it's much better to treat uh, up front. And when Bill Tapp was here, um, prior to Bartos uh, and Arun, we didn't have mutational analysis at that time. And we would uh, have a baseline PET CT scan, treat them with the Quebec for about a month. And then we would re-image them just to make sure that the drug was working. And then we would, uh, if it was working, we'd ride it, uh, usually for about six months, and then we'd take out the tumor. Um, that has been refined now with mutational analysis. You can figure out the dose of the drug to be on them if they should even be on the uh, So uh, I think uh, now I think you really do need to have the mutational status prior to treating. But um, we were doing it. For, we've been doing it for a long time. There's a number of studies out of. There's one out of Andy Anderson. Um, and there's one I believe from the Mayo with a large series as well. Ours is, would be one of the largest series. Of Follow. So we'll get that out to provide the evidence. Uh, obviously, a prospective trial would have to be done. There's a number of that are ongoing right now, evaluating the same question. Um, the the question about so high risk primary disease without metastasis is pretty straightforward. You have to take out the tumor. Uh, ideally, if it's high risk, you treat them up front and then take out the tumor. Um, the role of surgery for patients with advanced disease, I think, is uh, is controversial. It's something that we debate uh, in a lot of these sarcoma conferences. Um, the largest ex experience with this is uh, my friend Rao, who said that Brigham, uh, because he's basically George Dimitri's surgeon, and George pushed uh, him to operate on these patients with advanced disease, and he wrote up this. Uh, experience of that a few years ago in uh, JCO, uh, basically saying that you could do it. There's no real evidence uh, that versus uh, whether it's helpful or not. But the feeling in the community is amongst the surgeons and the oncologists is that you should remove uh, all, if not, if close to all of the disease that you can because there's less volume of disease exposed to the drug on a regular basis, so the incidence of resistance is lower. Now, whether that plays out or not is unclear. They've been trying to come up with a randomized trial to prove this point, this, that, the other thing. But I would consider the standard at this time, uh, somebody with advanced disease in the abdomen, uh, who's responded to the drug, uh, the feeling is that you should remove as much disease as possible uh, within reason. Um, we always push that point, like, should you give the patient a permanent colostomy? The answer, the answer is no. Should you do a major liver resection? Well, sometimes. So the extent of the operation can depend on, on the morbidity of the situation and the like. But as a general rule, uh, or the general perception is that with advanced disease, responding to Gleevec, you should remove as much disease as possible. Um, the rest of surgery is pretty straightforward. I think that obviously the real advance in this disease, and it's a model for it, is from the medical oncology point of view. Um, we were trying intracranial chemotherapy and the like, and it really was very frustrating, and I'm thankful that we're not doing that anymore. So I'm going to end here and turn it over to a room. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions, but there, the original just two take-home points. The original ACOSIC trial for adjuvant disease was originated from our intracranial chemotherapy study, and thankfully uh, the drug came out while that was being pushed through. The nomogram uh, that is now used uh, for GIST uh, originates out of the original sarcoma nomogram that the UCLA patients validated. And that Collaboration between institutions or high volume institutions with these rare diseases is really important. That's one of the things I think we showed with.
with a, a series of papers on various <coughs> subtypes of sarcomas. When I was at Sun Ketter, we combined the two databases from here and Sun Ketter. Um, the data for those uh, studies is from patients like yourself that we track and keep as well. The tissue that we can send you for is used. So those, uh, those are important studies, and it does make a difference uh, by participating in those. You know, beyond the specialty expertise, none of that information is really captured on a regular basis in the community. Um, it, it, you know, just going to a surgeon that just takes these tumors out and is not trying to learn anything, I think is, I don't want to say a waste, but it's not, uh, it's not less than ideal. So, it does make a difference participation participate in these studies, and I think it's important. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, otherwise, we will roll on to our My question is, uh, can you talk a little bit about CyberKnife and RF ablation and when they should be used or not used? Um, CyberKnife, uh, RF, they're just different forms of local control, uh, as is surgery. Um, the morbidity of them is less. Um, say you have disease in your liver, um, I would consider RF to be a gold standard uh, from my point of view. Um, CyberDive is the ability to just give, give radiation in a very high dose of a, a focused area. There's, they've never really done a trial, so the original success in surgery with operating on the liver for metastatic disease comes out of colon cancer. Uh, and the largest experience was actually some veteran. They've never really done a trial comparing RF versus resection. I think the standard is considered resection. Uh, those tend to be patients with isolated metastases. So you wouldn't offer a, a resection to somebody with more advanced disease. Um, but it's, to be honest with you, it's very unclear. Uh, radiofrequency ablation is very good and almost as effective as surgery. Uh, the one downside on it is that the tumor, there's different cutoffs, but the smaller the tumor, the greater the success with RF, and that's true with CyberKnife as well. Uh, but basically, there are different modalities in terms of local control. Um, if possible, RF, I think, would be the better, uh, based on the his his historic uh, context with colon cancer. But uh, CyberKnife is, is another means of local control as well. Uh, 